So hi, everybody, and welcome to our session here, which is going to be about digital health for all. How about to scale digital across borders? Um, there are a couple of implications to this, which, which we will um, uh, discuss over and over again. And for all the viewers out there who come from different parts of the world, we have examples for you that come from Europe, mainly from Germany, as well as from the United States. We have a phenomenal uh, lineup of speakers here. Um, but we are presenting this as lessons learned. So um, the idea is that that we can share with you things that work well or not so well for us and why we think that is the case um, so that you have the opportunity to think about what does it mean for the country that you are in. Um, so we look forward to discussing topics around access and equity, uh, health equity especially. Uh, we want to touch on sustainability um, and on scalability of, of different solutions from sort of primarily a reimbursement um, point of view. However, um, reimbursement is more than just the moment at which you get reimbursed. There is a long tail before and also a long tail afterwards, as many of you know. Um, so we will be touching on different aspects along this journey of, of any digital therapeutic. Um, before we, we jump into it, I just would quickly like to introduce you to our uh, phenomenal lineup of speakers. So there's Tonya, Tonya Doubt. Um, who has a background in, in healthcare policy studies and in public health, with a focus primarily on, on global and international health. Um, and she has been working for quite a while now on different topics around healthcare economics, market access, and reimbursement, and is currently uh, vice president at MCRA, where she does just that. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Anna sophie Geier, who is dialing in from Berlin. Um, and she is the managing director of what's called in German, the uh, Spitzenverband Digitale Gesundheitsversorgung, which basically translates to the German Digital Health Association. Um, and this association acts as the common voice of all the e-health providers and promoters in Germany, um, which has become particularly relevant in the wake of the Digital Health Care Act, which if you haven't heard of, uh, you will certainly learn more about right now. And then last and certainly not least, we have Brandon O'Leary, who, um, um, is from uh, from the, the FDA, Acting Director of the Digital Health Center of Excellence. And what I find particularly interesting is um, his original background is in mechanical engineering. So he brings a, a very different perspective into all of this. So thank you all for being here. And um, before we actually start discussing digital health, digital therapeutics and the reimbursement, let's maybe start with a definition. And given that we have somebody here from the FDA who's quite an authority in in defining also, um, among other things, uh, and setting the pace also quite often. Uh, could you share with us a little bit on, on, on what definition you find is most workable or that the FDA finds is most workable? Well, Sven, it's true. Step one is often defining and FDA does a lot of work there, uh, whether it's with international right. partners or in this case, actually, we had a, a really nice working group with the NIH uh, called the Biomarkers Endpoints and Other Tools Working Group um, that came up with a definition. But before I get to it, I think, you know, what digital health is really about, it's about reorienting healthcare to center around the patient instead of the facility. And that involves the convergence of computing power, connectivity, sensors, software, um, all used in healthcare. Whether those are used to develop a medical product, uh, to study it, used as a medical product, or even used with it as an adjunct or a companion. But really, especially at home or on the go, for everything from healthy living to disease prevention, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, and management. And so it's a it's a huge topic, um, but one that's increasingly important in our healthcare system. Oh, thank you for that, um, Anna. In Germany, our lawmakers also ended up uh, bringing out a definition which has become really relevant, especially for reimbursement. Can you share a little bit uh, more about what spoiler alert DIGA is and and the Digital Healthcare Act behind it, and how that might be different or or similar? Yes, uh, sure. I think um, in Germany, that makes it very interesting because for us, digital health is actually in all the discussions about it. They are brought to this new field, which are um, DIGA, as you mentioned, digital health applications. And they are uh, medical um, devices that are in the hands of the patient and support um, the patient in treating the disease or also in diagnosis and monitoring the disease. Um, and uh, what's, what's especially um, yeah, important about it, that everybody in Germany um, is available or can, can get these uh, new uh, digital therapies. And, and that's, uh, like, that was a big step for us in 2020 to introduce that. Tonya, um, 
when we prepared for this, you made an interesting comment uh, around definitions, and I was hoping you could maybe share it again. Yeah, I, I think that just, and we had talked about the fact that digital health encompasses such a broad spectrum of you know, telehealth technologies, remote patient monitoring um, devices, or artificial intelligence. And, um, and I think that depending on who, you're, who you ask, the regulatory bodies, the payers, um, or even a hospital system or the innovator, um, the digital health definition is very, very broad. Um, but I think narrowing it down to specific, um, maybe even benefit categories, as we call them in the United States, where are they falling and, um, and where are they being used? Are they being used in the home? Are they being used as a, you know, a, a patient monitoring tool by the provider from a provider's office? I think there's, there's um, still some work to be done um, in really defining and, and creating a consistent definition on what is digital health. Mm -hmm. And probably we will have to go through these motions over and over again as new technologies emerge and, and possibilities and so on. Um, so I think that's that's the first maybe takeaway is the importance of of having clear definitions and um, and also you know there's the saying whenever you measure you define so whatever outcomes we look at and so on that also has implications uh, for you know where the reimbursement happens and what people are going to build and so on. Um, so, but I think we, we can work with, with what we've just learned uh, for the sake of this um, exercise. And then, of course, it's up to everybody to understand how things might be different and why in the environment that they work in. Um, but I'd be curious, just from your very personal experiences so far, and um, maybe, I don't know, Tonya, you would like to, to, to start. Um, what is it that you think, or what, what are the things that maybe surprised you um, or things that, that, that you notice that work particularly well at the moment and that maybe don't work so well within your very sort of personal realm of, of experience? Just in terms of specific technologies or within the construct of reimbursement in the U.S.? <laughs> within the construct of, of reimbursement in the U.S., um, but you can also focus it down on certain technologies where you feel like it's not working here or it's particularly working well there. Yeah. Yeah, I think what, what's working well or what needs to be, um, I think, more refined is the realization from the digital health innovators that they need to generate data to show not the, just the validity of the technology or does it work, but really to uh, demonstrate that the technology is actually impacting health outcomes. And that's where we differ a bit from the regulatory side on the you know, market access side is um, we want, the payers want to know um, the hospital systems who are using these, these um, technologies as well as the providers want to understand the clinical utility of the digital health technology and how is it impacting patient care? How is it changing the way that they manage patients? So I think that's been, um, I worked, I've done some work in molecular diagnostics and that was um, not well understood in that space when it was, you know, evolving in the early stages. But I think in the digital health space, there is a realization that that data needs to be produced. That's yeah. a positive in my mind. Brandon, what are, you, what are your... Yeah, I think Tanya raises a key point and really what's been working well in the United States, I think, is a risk-based approach uh, to initial market access. Uh, but it's something that you always want to see expanded claims come from that. You, you want to see that data continue to get generated and you want to see these devices continue to be enhanced. Um, and upgraded over time so that they can have that bigger impact on patients and show greater value uh, down the line. And so I think, you know, particularly here in the public health emergency, we've put some policies in place to make sure that patients can have access to the tools that they need uh, in the current context so that they can get the care that they need and have that on-ramp uh, to more substantial care uh, or in-person care when needed. Um, but fundamentally, that risk-based approach is something that we're looking to continue to ensure that we can really balance the, the benefits of these products uh, with their low risk. And is there anything that surprised you in, in during your work that works particularly well? I mean, I was going to say um, what, what's been exciting to see as well, and I wish my colleague um, was here to share this, but um, from a clinical perspective, a CRO, so clinical research organization, it's been exciting to see the use of digital health therapies in managing um, a clinical study. So rather than using the traditional ECRFs, they're actually using digital health technologies to really determine, um, you know, is that technology working within that study you know, cohort? And that's been really exciting. That's that's a very much evolving area. 
Um, I think what another thing that's been exciting and what's worked well, um, and I don't want to get into the granular details here. I could talk for 45 minutes on this, but if you're familiar with the Viz AI technology, that was the first AI technology in the United States to get payment from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, under what's called a new technology add-on payment or NTAP. So that was very exciting. In the US, we have a very, we have very much a fee-for-service payment structure. We do not have one single entity that's defining consistently the data that's needed or even payment structures. Um, so we always look to CMS to really be the you know, the, the key player to, to establish the benchmarks. Um, so I think there's a willingness from CMS to um, bring forth and to look at a different type of payment model um, or fitting into the existing payment model with a subscription model, which is what Vizi I had um, and looking at other technologies to do so. So that's been exciting, that's worked well. Again, Viz AI saw the need for clinical data to show and demonstrate positive outcomes because that's one of the requirements to achieve a new technology add-on payment in the US. So that's been exciting. And maybe just to build a bit on yeah. what Tanya was bringing up there, I think that in the digital health technology space, we really do see a tremendous opportunity to improve the way that we study medical products generally uh, in the United States. And so earlier this year, FDA issued a draft guidance on digital health technologies for use in clinical investigations that talks about some of the considerations that you need to be taking into account when you decide what's fit for purpose uh, for determining how well your medical products are working and how this data can really help provide richer and fuller data um, about how patients do uh, when, when they're using other medical products. And so um, we see really wonderful opportunities there to improve, uh, improve diversity in clinical trials, uh, improve the way that we study these products and ultimately um, result in digital health technologies that can also be authorized. Mm -hmm. and yeah, no, <laughs> just uh, not obviously. I think it's a super important uh, point: of diversity of data and um, enhancing it with new technologies and again, getting better data sets for all kinds of uh, clinical studies, studies that we do. But coming back to your uh, question, Sven, um, basically, what kind of was positive, uh, surprising was that we um, in, in Germany um, introduced this new concept, digital um, uh, therapeutics, or DIGA, the abbreviation within a really short um, time and was between passing the law and the first DGA was um, below one year, which is super fast for the German healthcare system. Um, and right now we have um, around 30 different uh, therapy uh, opportunities for, for patients. Um, I think was um, what we still have to work on is the user friendliness of the whole process, because uh, in Germany, we just build up this digital ecosystem. And right now, for example, the patients uh, get a paper, a piece of, piece of paper, they have to bring it to the insurance company, and then they get uh, the, the code uh, to actually open open the app. So we need a, a, a prescription for all fields. And we're working on this um, at, at the moment, for example. And um, that's what I really realized. You always have to um, have a bridge between the digital therapy and the um, analog. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 um, all the physicians and, and the psychotherapists, uh, people working um, every day with the patients. Um, you need the bridge there. You need hybrid models um, because only because you have the therapy, it's not being prescribed or the patients don't know about it. So it's super important to actually communicate well what are the benefits. And I totally agree to, uh, to Brandon and Tony yeah, it's so important to have the data and um, that's actually established in the, in the process in, in Germany. So you have to provide a medical benefit or, and this is super interesting, also a new category in the, in the, in the uh, German healthcare system. It's um, structural um, um, yeah, effects that you can measure. For example, coordination of processes or health uh, literacy of patients or adherence. So these kind of um, endpoints can be um, yeah can be shown in a clinical uh, study um, of the digital therapy. And I think it's a big step forward because it needs to move. And Brendan also mentioned uh, it to a more patient-centric system. And by gathering these data, we move into these directions. So maybe for the audience also. Um, DIGA stands basically, if you would translate it for um, a digital health application, right? And it doesn't necessarily, that's what Anna just alluded to, have to be a therapeutic. It can also be something that just makes your life easier in the sense that you have to go to the doctor not so often. It reduces the burden of care. Um, your, your relatives are better informed and that leads to benefits to the patient and so on. The definition, however, requires that it comes to the benefit of the patient and that it can't have a strong human component. So 
telemedicine, for example, or if, it, if a strong part of your solution is telemedicine, you would disqualify for reimbursement via this new DIGA scheme uh, because they essentially just want to have like um, uh, reimbursement for something that, that's purely digital. And this is getting criticized, right? Because a lot of people say, well, when does care really happen in a vacuum? When is it really just, you know, the, for the patient only? Isn't it often uh, where, the, where the biggest impact isn't that often at the intersection of uh, doctors working with patients or patients with therapists or, you know, having the, the relatives more involved and so on and so on. So that is, um, that is one topic. Um, the, the second area where um, there's still a lot to be cleared out is um, the whole the whole question around you know being reimbursable doesn't mean being prescribed. So what do you need to do to actually get doctors on board? Um, part of it is the user experience that that Anna just mentioned, where of course you have um, you also have some friction for the doctors, but the other part is they also need to to feel like they know what they what they're prescribing. If you prescribe aspirin. It's the same compo compound as, as decades ago. It's validated and they know what they're doing, but an app might change. And in Germany, for example, it's, it's even prohibited, um, to, to give out free versions of the app because it would be considered as a potentially sort of a bribe. Um, and, and so the doctor said, but I can't, I can't test it. So how am I supposed to prescribe it? And, um, here yeah, I was wondering if, if you all can maybe share some experience on, on how to make sure it actually reaches the patients beyond the the mere okay i'm eligible now for reimbursement and maybe anna you you could uh, start with some thoughts and then i think brandon you also have some some nice uh things around you know how do you make it transparent and you know that would be good to hear um, yes, sure. So um, actually, I have to I have to add. It's possible for for uh, physicians to get test accounts, but only for a limited amount of time. So for fourteen days, you can uh, get a test account of a physician and I or psychotherapist. Um, and I think it's super important that you also mentioned that that they know what they prescribe and they know which patient is um, yeah uh, what 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 patient could use it. And and um, so th that's possible, but we are working for having an unlimited account because, uh, yeah, physicians tend to, I mean, only a short period of time doesn't work that much in, in daily practice. So I think we need to also um, look at the law there. Um, then to the next point, how do we um, spread the word that this new opportunity is there? I think we have this um, topic in all other fields as well, but especially when it's something totally new. Um, and for example, uh, we offer as, as the association um, a certified um, uh, courses during the evenings where the physicians can attend and they get all the evidence that's there, they get all the information how they can prescribe it. Um, and I think these kind of things will um, like different little pieces and, and steps and information bits uh, will help at the end. Um, but it will take some time. <laughs> that's for sure. We see the prescription rates are not as high um, as we want them to be, but we see also an increase. And I think this is totally normal. It's like the innovation curve. You always have the early adopters and now you need like the big mass and especially for the projects like the e-prescription, like our electronic health records, you need the big mass using it because you get the full, um, yeah, the full potential of it. Um, so yeah, we have some more work to do, but we are on a good track. Yeah, and I think just to add to what Dr. Geyer just said, um, it same thing is true, you know, in the U.S. Behavior change is always a challenge, and um, and it's hard for some, you know, some people versus others to maybe adapt. Um, but I think what I would what I would say and what I would recommend to the innovators of digital health therapies is really understanding the care pathway of when your where your technology is going to be used. Um, I have numerous examples in various disease areas, urology, um, cancer, cancer management, um, where physicians are used to and they want patients to come in for an office visit, a face to face. They're getting paid for that. They're used to that and they are not necessarily um, savvy with or don't want to adopt um, or they're not in a rush to adopt telemedicine and those types of therapeutics. And so I think really understanding the incentives and disincentives in the care pathway and how that physician is being reimbursed, um, you know, what their preferences are is really, really important. And so really just doing that primary research with the end user and not making assumptions that it's going to be adopted with open arms, you know, understanding the referral patterns, as we've talked about, really, really important for innovators to understand that. 
I agree. The clinical workflow is incredibly important. I think it's actually understanding where you integrate, for example, an AI ML device into the clinical workflow might even be the first of 10 good machine learning practices that we put out with uh, Health Canada and MHRA last fall. Um, because we, we really do find that um, these technologies work best when they're designed with the end user in mind right from the start. Uh, we're, we're also finding that, you know, come to FDA early and open that conversation about what kind of evidence uh, you, you can and intend to generate here, because we see a lot of opportunities to really, you know, design the study carefully so that it can be used for more than one purpose. Uh, we actually have something we call the Payer Communication Task Force here uh, with CDRH. We use to facilitate communication between device manufacturers and payers to really shorten the time between FDA authorization and coverage decisions uh, down the line. And so when, when you do first come to FDA, don't think that you have to be completely done uh, designing your study or completely done deciding what your device is going to be used for um, or completely done with, with really anything. Uh, come with that initial conversation. And uh, if you'd like, uh, through that payer communication task force and other efforts, we can really bring a broad group of stakeholders into the conversation uh, to find the right path forward. Mm. Brenton, can I ask you about um, the whole topic around AI and transparency? So, you know, there's always this discussion around, well, we have a black box. Doctors don't know how to deal with it. Um, maybe at some point you can release parts of it, make it more transparent. Maybe, you know, there's conflicts with trade secrets and so on. What do I do if I'm an innovator and I'm, I'm collecting data? What's, how, what transparency requirements are there from an FDA perspective, from an end user perspective? Sure. I'll start with just distinguishing a little bit between um, what you might call explainability and transparency. And so, you know, when you think about artificial intelligence, sometimes you're talking about rules based expert systems, for example, that might follow a decision tree or something that's, you know, incredibly pre, pre prescribed uh, and determinable. The, these don't always work as well, you know, certainly in imaging, they don't work as well as neural networks and other techniques that maybe aren't as explainable. Um, we, we don't want to let explainability get in the way of performance when we have a technology that's going to work better for patients, right? And so that's when we really start to talk about transparency instead of explainability. And what we mean when we talk about transparency is ensuring that the users uh, and those who are affected by the product have the information they need to use the product effectively and to know where the product works and for what it works, right? And that's sort of bread and butter basics uh, for an, FDA, an organization like FDA, where we are all about truth and labeling and making sure that the user knows how to use the product. So transparency for AI can really come down to, you know, how was it trained? Uh, what data was used? Um, how was it tested? And, you know, when we think about testing for AI in particular, Think about robustness. Think about generalizability beyond one specific healthcare facility. And this is especially important if you're thinking about a product that's going to be deployed internationally. There are differences in care uh, between different countries. And these are things that you need to plan for at the outset so that you can make sure that if you do need a localized algorithm instead of sort of a more global algorithm, uh, you, you can plan for that in advance. Um, but fundamentally, it's going to come down to, you know, how did you train the algorithm? How did you validate that algorithm? What independent data sets did you bring to it? How confident are you in its performance in diverse populations? Uh, and how can we know when to use it? I think that's that's extremely important. And uh, I, for example, I'm, I'm working on an AI-based startup now in Berlin, where of course, you know, if, if we look at the population that we will be training on, it will be primarily German. There will be maybe some Turkish, Italian, maybe some Russian, Ukrainian, etc. There might be some Syrians and so on and so on. But, but you know, the, I, it will struggle to get significant data from a lot of other populations. So um, I, I have to early on uh, think about, you know, where else can I get the diversity that I need to, um, to really have an algorithm that I can spread. Um, or maybe it means that in the beginning, when I think about where do I expand, that I will expand in the countries where there's a similar type of demography available that, that I can, you know, um, make, make transparent on, on why it might work here or not, right? And then I have to do a second study later on, which I can also plan for quite early, but this becomes part of my, my rollout expansion strategy then. So I think, thank you, uh, Brenton. I think that that's um, very important. And, and actually, um, also maybe a good uh, opportunity to discuss this whole topic of internationalization a little bit further. So, um, also, Anne, um, I think um, one concern that I, I that I often hear from investors is that they say, you know, Europe is thinking too small. They think in even in their own countries, not even in the region. And now you have this German law coming up, which says, okay, if you, you they require you to have done studies in Germany and so on, and you, there's this this concern: aren't you overfitting your solution now 
to to Germany and to Germans in the German care reality. Um, at the same time, we now see that France is trying to follow suit on this. Maybe Belgium will jump in, uh, and we will have other similar laws that allow reimbursement of digital apps if they meet certain criteria. You know, so being uh, a medical device first and foremost. Secondly, uh, you know, having the the evidence in support of um, certain outcomes and of safety and so on. Uh, but if if you would be giving an advice now to startups, um, what what would you tell them? Given that they also have resource constraints and can't maybe do the ideal full scenario of studies everywhere and so on, what what's your viewpoint? Or what would you say to an investor pushing back on this TIGA law, for example? Right. I think there was never a better time than now to actually, um, yeah, build build a digital health application and. Um, I'm saying that because, um, yeah, we've already mentioned that Germany started that way um, and we actually expanded it now to digital care, um, a huge field because there are so many uh, caregivers missing in Germany, 100,000 already today, and we are living in an aging society. And um, France has jumped on it. You have mentioned it. Other countries are super interested and uh, we have never imagined because we're, <clears throat> we're so lagging behind and we still are in certain fields. But um, with this um, idea of digital therapeutics in general, like the digital health applications, I think um, it, it's just the right movement for also after the pandemic where everybody has seen where the big potential lies um, in digital health. And um, <clears throat> um, yeah, we are just on, it's kind of an historic moment where we can get a European legislation also on that, um, which is, yeah, discussed also um, at the moment. And then you have, um, yeah, um, bigger scaling opportunities for sure. And I think we have similar, I mean, with the data security, data safety is a, is a big, um, uh, I think, um, um, and, and also interoperability. And I think if we align on these two things and then discuss about the evidence, we already, Brendan also mentioned, it, it's, it's a big question if you can use the study also in other countries. And I think, I don't know if we can answer this for all indications or like all settings, but um, I would definitely argue that um, it, it will be important to have a study that you can use in multiple countries. Um, because then you have the opportunity to actually um, <clears throat> scale your product and you don't have to uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> do it all over again. And I think the causality and, and, and the question, I think it, it's, it's also possible. I think we can work on a framework that, that allows that. Um, yeah, so, and I, it's, it's also a question, question of external validity, what we also have with studies in other fields, like in the drug area, everywhere, like, is it, uh, can it be transported to to different uh, patients? And if if the manufacturer can show this, then it's a good chance that um, yeah you can um, scale up fast also in in different countries, in different healthcare systems. Tonya, what would be your advice to uh, startups entrepreneurs thinking about international expansion? Yeah, I think um, at least, well, in the U.S. specifically, I think looking at a, and going back to the studies and data that's going to be required, um, looking at a finite patient population, an indication of who that, who that technology, that digital health therapy is going to be most impactful for, rather than going very, very broad. Um, but I think, as we mentioned earlier, really just understanding those care pathways and you know, you, the U.S. is one, you know, one country, of course, with varying care pathways and incentives and reimbursement methodology. But then you go to Europe and it's it is very country specific. So um, I would just say if you're going to launch, you know, where are you going to launch really? And where's the opportunity really understanding within um, if we're th thinking of Europe? really understanding what's happening in that specific country. So it's versus, you know, versus just getting a CE mark and it's good for every country. You really need to understand what's happening. Well, I was just going to say, you know, there's certainly work to do here and there's hardly a week that goes by that I'm not engaged with some regulator international to try to harmonize on approaches. And it's, it's challenging. I mean, certainly in the U.S. here, we're dealing with the medical device regulatory framework that's fundamentally hardware oriented uh, and wasn't designed with digital health in mind. Um, so, so we do face some, some challenges there. Uh, but when it comes down to it, the science is the science. And I think that that's an area where we really can see good convergence uh, around the world right here uh, at the outset. And it's it's something that we're working on 
very, very hard. And so um, even most recently with the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, they put out a, a new document on terminology for me, machine learning enabled medical devices that I think provides a really good foundation for how you can interact with regulators around the globe on these products, how you can describe them and your approach to them, uh, and really fundamentally even make some good comments on modification models for these products and what to do as the environment around these products shifts. And so it's great to see that international alignment on our approach here and finding an approach that's gonna work as broadly as possible around the world is, is really important because borders don't work the same way for software as they do for other products. Yeah, I mean, that's that's reason for hope, right? If, if we if we have alignment on the, on, on the fundamental parts, then um, there will still be differences and they make also sense quite often, not always, because sometimes it's just legacy, but sometimes it's adapting to different realities. But if, if um, on the essential parts, you know, we can agree, uh, that makes it much easier to to argue and to reuse the signs that you have in order to make a case somewhere else. Um, now, what what I also would find interesting is maybe we can touch a little bit, and um, uh, we're soon coming to an end. So, uh, uh, just some maybe some quick reflections before we have a final closing remarks. Um, when you think about uh, pricing topics, and we want to make them sustainable, that means that on the one hand side. Uh, it can't be, can't be too expensive because then it's too much of a burden. But if it's not expensive enough, then of course there's a lacking incentive for the development of these tools and they can be very, very expensive. Even if it's digital, uh, with all the studies that need to be done, it's quite an upfront investment with also an not always <clears throat> very certain outcome of whether or not it gets adopted, it gets reimbursed, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, if you, you know, if you're more expensive than the offline players, then they might start to protest and say, why? Well, if I do my my one on one psychotherapy and I only get eighty percent of what this app gets, so although it has zero marginal cost, um, you know how is that being fair? And and are there any reflections that that you have any any quick lessons learned um, on on how to get pricing right? Maybe also too early to really say. The, right? the only thing, well, <clears throat> there's I think that's a complex question within the U.S. framework. Um, as, and I'll just say this, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our system is still very largely based on a fee for service payment structure um, that is based on unit cost. So, for example, the NTAP new technology add on payment methodology I mentioned earlier is based on um, the, you know, the cost of the technology being higher than what's being reimbursed today, not on value. So, it's not based on what value is it bringing to the patient or the hospital system or the provider who's managing that patient population. So I think that in the U.S. is a significant challenge still. Um, there's many tech, many AI technologies are um, reimbursed and set their business model based on a subscription basis, subscription model. And um, that's usually with a hospital system who bears financial risk for managing a patient population. Um, you know, on the commercial payer side here in the U.S., you have uh, varying structures of payment methodologies, but by and large, commercial payers in the U.S. are not managing patient care. They're paying claims. It's an actuarial exercise. And so I think we need to get to a value based type of structure um, and move away from a fee for service structure because you've got the AMA, American Medical Association, you know, developing coding constructs, you have CMS developing payment constructs and, and coding as well. There's just so many disparate groups when we talk about the reimbursement structure in the US. So it makes pricing a bit difficult because you really need to understand what methodology you're going to be, what payment mechanism you are going to have to adhere to. And then when you talk about, when we talk about digital health therapies that are being used in conjunction with a surgical procedure or being used in conjunction with a durable medical equipment device. It gets very tricky because those two uh, technologies are likely going to be reimbursed under different mechanisms. So um, I would just say that, that really understanding in detail the payment mechanisms that you're going to have to adhere to is important in the pricing um, decision. Very nice. Thanks. So that, that was very comprehensive and, and we're actually coming to uh, to the end of this this session, although I would love to keep going. Um, maybe one one very last question uh, to, to all three of you. 
if you were to give one piece of advice to innovators out there, you know, thinking about reimbursement and market access in the digital health space, what what would it be? Um, Brandon, maybe you want to start? Sure. Yeah, don't hold back in your conversations with FDA. Lay out the situation that you're facing mm. and the plans that you have, and we'll help you find a path forward that's going to work. And and do it early, right? There's not this one FDA moment. Uh, right? Always. Early and often. Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, yes, I think it was mentioned before. Um, first, have the vision and know exactly in which indication field and with which patient um, uh, area you, you want to focus on. And if you know that, and if you have prepared well what data should be collected to actually convince uh, a payers at the end, um, I'm pretty convinced that it will be a good track now to go on. Yeah, just to echo what, you know, what Brendan said, it's it's really dealing with and, and laying out the reimbursement and regulatory strategy early and in parallel. Um, I work with my regulatory colleagues um, all the time where we're synchronizing on what is the regulatory pathway and how is that implicating the reimbursement pathway, um, but really also understanding the unmet need in, again, with the specific patient population for your um, either digital health device or any device you're bringing to to the market is really important. Fantastic. I'm so sorry. This is only uh, less than five hours because I would, I would just love to uh, to continue. I think there's a lot of uh, knowledge and, and insight out there and in your heads. Um, and the combination has been wonderful. So um, big, big thanks uh, for your time. And, and thank you to uh, everybody who's listening. Um, feel free to reach out uh, if, if there's... Uh, something that we would like to share um, and uh, and we look forward to, uh, to to watching what all of you are going to build and, and what clever ways you find to expand globally and and, and work with the realities that, that we all have in these different countries. So uh, keep surprising us <laughs> and thanks so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.